Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Australians, welcome to an episode of Tommy Talk. My name is Juan, did much your Anthony. This is a judo podcast for judo players by two judo players. So, Anthony, how you doing? I should ask that question first next time. But then uh, you, get to you have the advantage of doing the, the, <laughs> the intro. intro. You want to yeah, do the, the intro? intro. I'll let you. I'll let you I'll, do the I'll intro. I'll come up with my own intro. All right. Yeah. You, <laughs> yeah. Stop stealing my shit. All right. <laughs> um. Yeah. You know how last episode we were talking about like the car accidents and the accident outside my block. Yeah. So yeah. After we recorded, I was like, uh, I was heading out to grab dinner with my friend Sarah and. Literally, there was an accident right there. They blocked up the road. There's glass everywhere. The car was totaled. The cops like uh-huh. blocked up half the lane. I was just like, man, I literally just talked about this. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe we should please, not talk about stuff like that again. <laughs> just please, people, be safe out there. Okay. Especially if you're in Los Angeles, please, please, please be safe. Look both ways where you cross the street. And even if you got the green light, some, just, mm-hmm. just take a second. I mean, just look both ways. It doesn't hurt. You know, you might get someone honk at you, but it ain't going to hurt you. Hopefully. Yeah. I was reading someone also posting up a list of the most unfriendliest uh, bike cities, like cities mm-hmm. to bike in, not motorcycle, bike, yeah. bike in. And Los Angeles is ranked number one. So <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> it's not only me that feels unsafe, like hey, riding my bike here. This morning when I was driving, literally a guy was crossing the street. I, mm-hmm. I had the green light and I was going straight. And I luckily I saw the guy just crossing the red, just going across the street. And I was going and then he saw me and I saw him and, he, and he's like, oh, fine, go, man, go. And I'm like, yes, I have the green light. I don't want to hit you. Yep. Just stop. And that's one thing, that's a big pet peeve of mine about here in Los Angeles. When I go jogging and stuff and I'm driving, people on bikes, they, they one, they don't stop at stop signs. And two, they never stop at red lights. Well, some do, but a lot of them don't stop at red lights. I'm just like, I'm like, please don't get hit by a car. It, man versus, or bike versus car, I'm sorry, you're losing. That's just yeah, how it I is. I don't want to. I don't want to start that debate. But a lot of times, people, <laughs> people are like, "Well, bikers are dangerous because they ignore road signs and stuff like that." And then the bikers are like, "Well, those are the minority." And I mean, I don't have the statistics, but it happens pretty often. Like, yeah, uh, it does, it does yeah. seem like the minority to me. <laughs> there was a, pro- was not a problem, but uh, a few years ago, I think they still run around still. But it was called the Midnight Riders, I think they're called. Mm-hmm. And it was this big congregation of bicyclists that would, like, I think it was either Saturday or Friday mm-hmm. nights. They would all gather at this location where that now has a target. Now they would all gather there and they would just ride around Hollywood down Koreatown and stuff. And just be this huge, like 500 yep. bicyclists just going through red lights, mm-hmm. just going through everything. And I'm just like, I understand it's like fun and cool for you guys. I'm like, how dangerous if there's someone's not paying attention, mm-hmm. they say they have a green light and they just yep. drive right through. And exactly. you just knock five people over. You just drive, drive over. That's all right. Please be careful out there. Just for, for one, please, please, please be careful out there. All right. <laughs> yeah. I really wish we were bike, more bike friendly, like um, in Europe, for example, but the most bike friendly city I've been in is Portland. That's mm-hmm. like most pedestrian bike friendly. Um, but yeah, that's not happening in LA anytime. Not in my lifetime, at least. Yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anything else interesting happening to you? Oh, but it was actually kind of interesting to me. I finally got my new black belt that Anthony got me for Christmas. Oh, my Kusakura yeah. belt. I saw it that. says number one spicy ramen on it. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, no, it my, my katakana skills aren't that great. So I actually had to reread it. And I was like, does it actually say ramen on it? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I always make that joke. It does say one. It actually says wa yeah. on one. Yeah. And it's funny because I asked my wife, I was like, why does this one look different than the one that you write down sometimes? Like, oh, because this is how to cut the gun and I hit a gun and I cut. Is this is right? This is what foreigners are supposed to write their name yeah. as. And I'm like, oh, whatever. It looked cool to me, but I always make that joke. If someone has like a kanji tattoo on them, I always go up to them and I'll be like, "Hey, why do you got hot ramen on you? Or what do you got spicy ramen?" And they'll be like, "No, it says this. Oh, it says love." It's like, nah, I think it says spicy ramen. They'll get mad at me. What? What? <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't get something uh, embroidered on the other side of the belt. It could have got too expensive. That's why I ain't paying over it. What? I think what I gave you in the gift card should cover it. Didn't it? Did it? it? I, it I didn't think so. oh, I don't know. Whatever. It's probably some left or <laughs> gift card then. I yeah, got a simple belt. It's... It just says one on it. It's okay. You can only, well, you can't, you can't I get can't. it. You can't get embroidered anymore with that yeah. with the back. Yeah. But I can do it very carefully. <laughs> sewing it one at a time myself. You have to take it apart basically, but yeah. 
Yeah. I did have my joke of a uh, hot ramen or spicy ramen it did backfire me one time on set. I told someone this, um, knew someone actually knew what I said. <laughs> no, actually her ramen, her ramen, her, her, tattoo, ramen. <laughs> her tattoo was messed up. Oh. And it had the thing on her calf. And I was like, oh, what do you got hot ramen on your calf? She said, it says spicy. And I'm like, uh, oh, okay, it says spicy, <laughs> which is kind of weird. Yeah. And she's like, I- I'm sorry to yell at you about that. But it's just, so me and my sister, we were supposed to get, it was supposed to say hot and cold on us. Uh-huh. And her says cold, mine was supposed to say hot. But it turned out that they put spicy on me instead. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> That's why you should check with an Asian person, not just Google translate, uh-huh. you get your Chinese friend, your Japanese friend or something. If you want to get some kanji or head of or something, ask them. Same if you, you want to get some Korean written on you, mm-hmm. ask your Korean friend. All right. What this actually means. Because That's why I never want to get like Chinese uh, characters tattooed on my body because yeah. it, I feel like it just got ruined by so many people. doing it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so hip yeah. and trendy. Yeah. And when I, when I was 18, I wanted to get a tattoo, but I couldn't decide on what to get. And because I'm like, I can't imagine what I would want permanently tattooed on my body. So I just uh-huh. never got a tattoo. Plus when uh, I go to Japan, like you can't, can't go, go to hot, the springs. hot springs. So yeah. I'm like, forget that. I'm not going to get a tattoo. Yeah. I'm not a tattoo guy personally, but that's, that's just me. Like when I was younger, I was like, you all go through that phase. Like, Oh, what would I get? When I get this cool thing. And when I was younger, the tribal tattoo was a big thing. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't a big tribal guy, but I was like, I thought about it for a second. Hmm, maybe I should get a tribal. Which you see, you how, tri- you see how tribal the, the tribal Mayans. tattoo got ruined too. Like, yeah, you know. <laughs> I, well, oh, right man. now I feel it's like the Maori tattoos again, like the the big shoulder mm-hmm. stuff, the Maori stuff. Yeah. I think that's being destroyed right now by people. Well, but, I think in a few years people are gonna hate me for this, but in a few years, <laughs> I think it's gonna be the sleeves. The sleeves, the sleeves. are gonna be the, <laughs> the next thing that looks kind of well, eh. I like sleeves though. I, I do like sleeves. I just would never get them myself. Well, with going with, well, since we're on the topic of funny tattoos and stuff and people getting some stuff on them, our instructor, Sensei Fleet, has Hollywood Judo tattooed mm-hmm. on him, like our symbol of Hollywood, ju- not the symbol, but our kanji way that we write Hollywood Judo. Mm-hmm. Holly, holy wood holy woods. Judo yeah. on there on his arm. So I was like, so you put return to sender, or like if found, please return to <laughs> Hollywood on the bottom. Judo. Return to Hollywood Judo if found. If found, please return Hollywood <laughs> Judo. Oh, okay, sir. Please, I need to take you back to Hollywood Judo. If I do get a um, Chinese character or kanji tattoo, it will be it would be Judo. That's what I would put there. Judo. But I'm 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 not crossing out. Like when I find something I really want, that will still get a tattoo. But for now, I'm I'm I don't have anything in mind. No more hot springs. But yeah. you do you do have to be careful because now it's kind of a funny side story again. One of my students. When he got his black belt and turned 18, he got Taekwondo and Tong Sudo put on his back on both shoulder, mm-hmm. uh, both wing areas down, going all the way down his back now. Mm-hmm. Now he's in his late 20s, maybe early 30s now, mm-hmm. like maybe late 20s, early 30s he has now, doesn't do martial arts at all anymore. He's huge into rock climbing now. He has a professional job and stuff. Doesn't do martial arts. And we talked like, hey, why don't you do martial arts anymore? He's like, oh, I know about head trauma and all this stuff now. And I just think it's dangerous. Like you can still do kata and forms yeah. and hit pads and stuff, but doesn't do any martial arts anymore. But he has, we, we all know it's just an excuse. We all, we all know it's an excuse. I, I'm, I'm yeah. just saying it's, part, it's probably part of it, but we all uh, know that's not the main reason. Yeah, but it's like you got this tattoo that says Taekwondo on your back. It says Tong Sudo on your back here, and you don't practice at all anymore. Well, for some people, it's like a story, right? A story behind yeah. the tattoo. It's like, oh, when I was a kid, I used to do this. You know? <laughs> when I was younger, I used to kick yeah. ass. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So do you want to talk about like some news updates about what happened? At, I really didn't take notes on it, but if mm-hmm. people were interested, the um, Portugal, what was what city Grand, was it? Grand at? Slam. Uh, yeah, I Portugal don't remember. Grand- it's not, yeah, it's not Lipson. It's not, li- oh, was however it? you pronounce it. It's somewhere Lisbon. else. I can't remember. No, it's not all Lisbon. Right. Somewhere all right. Else. Whatever. It was in Azores. No, it wasn't. It was on the mainland. <laughs> all right. But they had the Grand Slam this past week. Some really good matches. Portugal did really well in there. We actually had, um, I believe it was the top of my head. I actually wrote down his name, but we had one American actually place in the yeah, minus 100 uh, kilos. Ellie uh, LA, LA Smith. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good for us really well. Cause you know, I'm not that's just saying we don't really place that that well usually at international tournaments, but Hey, coming up did really well. Yeah. First tournament of the year. Let's hope it keeps going for us yeah. Americans at least. I mean, and, uh, the Japanese did send people there too. So, I mean, even though the, the brackets weren't huge, mm-hmm. there was still a good amount of competition there. Mm-hmm. And 
Paris Grand Slam is uh, coming up. So France kind of sent their like second or third string there, I think. Mm-hmm. So Paris Grand Slam is this weekend. So it's only like been like a week or two weeks, I guess. And yeah, so it's a huge achievement still winning, winning a, a no, bronze medal. Winning a Grand Slam or I mean, winning a, yeah, winning a Grand Prix Grand is still Grand Slam. We're not win, no, we're not I winning, hope. but third place. Yeah. Well, hey, to me, that's podium, still place, podium, placing. Podium, placing, man. yeah. Hey, you have to win third place, all right? Yeah. You have yeah, to win hard. third place. People will give you shit about game third. You have to win third place. Yep. And then another thing that I said last time is that I thought she was retired. Hannah Martin. Hannah Martin. Yeah. She yeah. competed. It was her first uh, first tournament in a long time. It's funny because uh, after you said that, I looked it up. I was looking at her Instagram. And she's like, first tournament since I had a child. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> that was, that's I, awkward. God damn it. <laughs> damn it. <laughs> Screw us over. Ah, shit. <laughs> but um, yeah, she wrote on her. Uh, yeah, it was her Instagram. I looked it up on because I follow her stuff. I enjoy watching her judo and stuff. Her and her husband, the baby. <laughs> it's so cute, baby, baby. But um, she said that was like, two and a half or two and nine months like that from mm-hmm. two years of retirement and then having a child or whatever it was. That's a long time though, to take a break. And yeah. Hey, you can't get mad at me. If you haven't done judo in a year, in two and a half years, I'm probably going to think you're retired. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing other stuff. I'm probably you had a kid. I'm surprised to get back from having a kid. That's amazing right there. I yep. got to give it up to her. Well, it's like mom. uh Joko Tani. Yeah. She got to give it to judo kid. moms out there. Yeah. So uh, anything else happened to grand slam? Yeah. Grand so, Prix? I won't come on, Grand briefly want to talk about what well, I don't know if you watched most of it. I watched like a bit of it plus all the final blocks and there mm-hmm. were some amazing throws. Like yeah. um, I guess the rules are encouraging the better throws. There were a few, few okay, maybe not a few more than a few, but not too many <laughs> bad calls uh, uh-huh. rela- regarding um, for example, the head dives, they didn't call a bunch of the head dives. People mm-hmm. were like Uchimata onto the head and they didn't, weren't calling it. Um, there were some reverse Sewanage Shidos. Um, okay. There were safe se- uh, reverse Sewanages. This is the example of what I'm saying. It could be done safely. Like the arm and stuff weren't interlocked. Guy wasn't thrown on his head, but mm-hmm. still got a Shido for it. But the rules are rules, right? Um, yeah. The turn, I think it was the turnover. There was one, uh, no, no, not the one, one, one I talked to you about was the turnover, right? Where the guy mm. countered a front Uchimata. I, I oh. hate, calling, I hate yeah. calling front Uchimata, but people know what I'm talking about when I say front Uchimata. I had mm-hmm. a discussion with someone about this calling a front Uchimata, but uh, Obitori Gaeshi, that's the official name for it. <laughs> so someone countered that with the Uranage and they kind of landed and it wasn't clear who countered who. So I think mm-hmm. that was kind of a controversial decision there. And I do think they got the call wrong personally, but I think it's mm-hmm. close enough to be a gray area. So personally, I would let that slide, but there was another instance where someone fell on their front. Like it yeah. was not 90 degree angle. Like if you follow my Instagram, I kind of posted a story <laughs> about it saying like, I linked the part where Neil Adams was explaining the rule about mm-hmm. how it has to be 90 degrees. And he's saying, this is not a score. Yeah. And then the other part was then saying, that's totally a Wazari. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I will. I'm going to play Dill's advocate here. I'm going to play the bad guy. I don't mind playing it. But I'm going to be the bad guy here. All right. Hey, yo. So with your, oh, with the one that the reversal we're talking about first, let's first uh-huh. go with reversal. This is where it gets to nitpicky. And this is where the side judges, the video judges really come to play because this is what I've watched because they'll show the replays on their Instagram and stuff on mm-hmm. IGF Instagram. They'll show it in such slow motion to be like, look, okay, right, right, right there. They did that turn. Okay. Okay. The, 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 okay. It's their point then. The, the, but to the naked eye, like us watching it in full mm-hmm. speed, even in normal slow-mo, sometimes we'll be like, ah, it doesn't, that didn't work out. It didn't work that way. But in their super slow-mo, they'll be like, you see how he turned his hip. You see how his foot turned right there to show that he has control during the throw. And I, I know you and me and Philippe talked about that. It's like, well, did he initiate it before he was falling down? And that's where you were like, oh, he looked like he started throwing. It's very, when he hit the ground. it's very, very great. Like when I say yeah. it, it's like black and white. Cause I said, it looked like this, but then when yeah. you look at it, it's like, eh, it looks like it, you know what yeah, I'm that's saying? What you get. That's why you get the TV screen look or they, that little box thing. It's like, all right. So they're yeah. looking, the, they're looking at it from five angles up in the box and slow-mo super, too. Super, super slow-mo yep. and stuff. And then um, the one you said that was uh was Zotti, but it shouldn't be nothing in your opinion. It should have been nothing. Cause he fell on the front yeah. with less than a nine degree angle. Again, Dill's advocate. I watched it in the super slow-mo. 
when they landed, no. when they hit the mat. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I'm, when he I'm hit the bad mat. guy. They was on his side. It I was woke. never, ever ah, on the side at a 90 degree angle. Or greater. There, was an, there was an angle that they showed in super high def, slow-mo, one frame at a time. Oh, you're looking at it right now, aren't you? You're re-looking I, at it. <laughs> I, I want to relook it because you're making me feel like I'm crazy. But I remember before I posted it, I watched uh, it over and over at least 10 times before I... Because otherwise I want to make it um, back to back because mm-hmm. originally I'm like, okay, I'm just going to post it as a Instagram post with two pictures of the landing. But then yeah. I was thinking exactly what you were thinking. Like, what if he landed this way and rolled over? Yeah. So... I took the effort to record a video of the thing happening back to back. So uh, I'm pretty sure that didn't happen. I mean, I'll go check again after the podcast. And then if you guys are listening, again. Leave, if you guys are listening, leave a comment <laughs> below. Tell us what you think. I'm playing Let's devil's advocate here. Okay. I'm just playing devil's advocate. This is what I'm saying though. They could have seen when they do the super hyper slow-mo compared to when we look at our eyes, how they landed. And I'm just saying there's both sides. Okay. And I can, I can understand. I'm not saying like they're God, I'm like saying I can understand both sides. I, why am I giving them an out for, I really shouldn't be doing this. That but I, I don't am. think there, I don't <laughs> think there's an excuse. I don't think there's an excuse for the was for that was already called. There's no excuse for that. Mm-hmm. Um, for the Udanaga counter thing that I talked about, I think they're, like I said, I, I would let that slide cause it was kind of close. But uh, mm-hmm. it it would be like Dari below did grabbing someone in the hair. Like, how do you miss that? You know, that was like, bl- that's how do you miss that? You can't. Bl- like, <laughs> which is funny. I actually taught one of our girls when they were doing kiss like Tommy. It was like, so if the girl's wearing a ponytail, just grab her hair grab, as you yeah. go for a collar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, since they want, are you teaching me cheating? No, I'm not teaching you how to cheat. I'm just telling you how to skirt the rules a little bit. If her hair's in a way, it happens to be there. I just happen to grab it. Don't yeah. do it, please. Don't so do that. I, I also saw a few Shido calls for landing on the elbow. Mm-hmm. Like, and again, I thought it was a stupid rule. Like, mm-hmm. there's absolutely no reason for that rule to exist. But um, yeah, otherwise, great throws, great tournament overall. Like, if you haven't watched the um, day three finals, watch it. Like, um, Francesca and the heavyweights did some amazing throws that you don't usually see heavyweights do. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. And um, Chris Niki had some sick of Sotogaris. Like the, the timing the positioning was just like amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not day three though, but just <laughs> watch the final block. It's really that good. Was, Lots of good throws. Is that day four then? Day two, I think that was, was it day Chris two. Nicky. Okay. Day, no, no. Nicky okay. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 What am I thinking? The wrong one there. Yeah. All, all right. right so gold, that all happened. Gold, uh, Olympic gold medalist. Yeah. <laughs> So from day of, from time of when this is going to come out, that happened two weeks ago. So I'm going to look up what happening this weekend that we're recording. It would be last weekend. By the time you watch this video is a Paris mm-hmm. grand slam. Yeah. I'm excited. Cause I'm going to Philippe's place to watch it this yeah. Saturday, I think. So yeah. Are you going? Yeah. After I'm going to go now. Yeah. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Well, I'll go, you for a few hour, go for a few hours and go home and prep for Chinese new year celebration with my family. So. You didn't celebrate last week? I th- think it happened on a Tuesday. Did it? I thought it happened on Monday. Whatever. Time yeah, travel. I, I don't I don't know. I'm terrible with dates. So <laughs> yeah. So everybody out there, I don't hate Yay. Yeah. You're the tiger. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I see my tiger post. Ah, tiger post. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so they have the Paris Grand Slam is happening this week. Be some great matches. It's actually one of the bigger tournaments of the year. All countries you send their best players there. At least they're top two usually to send out there. Yep. So hopefully there's some good, well, hopefully there are going to be some good matches and it'd be yep. fun to see who comes out. And I would fun to see if Teddy Reiner's fights. That's I want to see if is. Teddy Reiner fights. There's um, um French team. I've been look, watching uh, Bukli. She's the girl, mm-hmm. last girl who beat uh, Dari. Well, not the last girl who beat her, but she was one of the first to beat Dari Beloded um, mm-hmm. a while back. And uh, yeah, she's one of those changing of the guard people that I was talking, mm-hmm. we were talking about, and I would like to see how much she's grown since then. Um, I think her technique is there. She's just lacking experience and and the pressure and the tactics that French judokas are are known for. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's interesting to to see how it, how it works out. Um, super excited. Yeah, I was pleasantly surprised by uh, Portugal. Grand Slam because I wasn't expecting much with the rule, but I was curious about the rules. So I was 
like I said, really surprised with how well, how many good throws I saw. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, the, I I don't want to make this too long, but I'm just, I'm just thinking about all the all the <laughs> awesome throws I saw. Like there was one mm-hmm. throw where the guy whips the guy around into a Seoi Nagi, I think. Mm. It felt, it looked like magic. Like the guy just like <laughs> it's like a gust of wind just blew him up and like <laughs> After he yeah. get up, do some fancy hand jazz stuff. Magic. Oh shit. Knocked on mic almost. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully oh God, we see a, see a lot more throws like that. Uh, uh Paris Grand Slam. So anyway, yeah. So the rule changes topic, right? So the rule changes oh, the rule didn't changes. ruin didn't ruin judo, right? That judo's still going. We're still doing all right. Uh, someone it someone already judo. <laughs> someone already on Reddit posted something about the reverse Sayanage, and I just think oh, that they have bit. I, I think this is why Give it up. It's dead. If, Sorry. If, if you haven't looked at our re, checked out our um, episode about the, discussing the rule changes, do it. And to summarize, we said that the IGF needs to clarify a lot more of this stuff. And that's exactly what I kind of saw on the online community in the mm-hmm. past few months uh, leading up to the Portugal Grand Slam is that a lot of people misunderstood what the rules actually were. Like yeah. another example would be someone thought that there, there was a ball and chain throw. And you know what, you know what ball and chain throw is, right? Mm-hmm. And another amazing throw that happened in uh, Portugal. So someone imagine you reaching uh, in between your um, legs with your legs wide open and someone grabbing your hand from behind and then just yanking it. Yeah. You, 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 you do you flip you over. That's a ball and chain yeah. throw. Yeah. Someone did that. And then someone's like, Oh, that's not a continuation because there was a pause before that happened. And I'm like, they're not on the ground. Like people are yeah. misunderstanding the continuation, grabbing the legs and all those throws that we're talking about, the Uchimata head dive thing, Uchimata Sukashi, like all that stuff is not, cl- it's not clear. It's very, mm. a lot of gray areas probably left there intentionally for their own referees yeah their own gray area so they yeah. can be like oh well, on this side more on that side oh but, who's fighting is it japan okay yeah yeah we'll let it go who's fighting some nobody country oh okay no they're, they're done they're done <laughs> yeah. taiwan oh. oh no no taiwan it is all fight. speaking <laughs> of no name country another reason you want to watch the heavyweights is the senegal guy got a bronze medal in heavyweight mm-hmm. amazing also the guy he did Mm-hmm. Okay. Not, without dragging in too long, basically. <laughs> yeah. That. <laughs> no, don't worry. Let's go. Just, I don't care. Good. Yeah. It's just amazing. Clar- they need to clarify the rules. Basically what I'm mm-hmm. saying a lot of people misunderstood and looked at a, a lot of the stuff that happened and was like saying, Hey, I thought the rule changes say you can't do this. I'm like, no, like that's not what they <laughs> meant when they said, when they did the rule changes. Hmm. And speaking of rule changes being clarified and clarification, me and Anthony are actually going to go to a rule seminar held here by Nanka. It's being held by Nanka, right? I don't know, but it's held by Gary Takamoto from yeah. um, Harbor Judo. And he was a IJF ref in, and he actually refereed in the uh, Rio Olympics. Rio. And I think he went to another one. I think he was in uh, China as well. Beijing. I think he was in yep. Beijing and Rio. Mm-hmm. And he's one of the best refs we have here in the area. He's one of the top refs in the country, international yeah. ref. A lot You're of actually, my under, a lot of my understandings about these gray areas of the rules actually came from asking him because he showed up to Philippe's coaching clinics a few times and I asked him these questions. I'm like, hmm. hey, why are they called this way? Like, especially the the rules regarding touching the legs. Um, mm-hmm. He clarified a lot of that stuff for me. So. Yeah, so we're gonna get some clarity, maybe some arguments, maybe a fight. I don't know. But we're gonna just, we're gonna go to the clinic and see what people say and what people's questions are. And we might break talk about that the next episode yeah. about our clarity on certain throws now and how it is about interpretation most of the time. It's about who interpreted it and how they saw it. So that's what's coming up. So let's get to the main crook of the episode today. So mm-hmm. here in Los Angeles, we're getting ready to have the Olympics in 2024. No, We're no. also getting ready to have the Super Bowl this weekend. Yeah, this week, yeah, Super Bowl, which I feel bad for the, I'm going to just say it right now. I feel bad for the, I don't know, this game, well, this episode will be out afterwards. So who knows? Yeah. No, no, no. It will be out, week, out afterwards. Is it going to be out afterwards? Today, Today's Friday. This is, um, we're recording early because we can't record on Sundays because I'm Chinese New Year. Yeah, no, and but the Super Bowl's on the 13th. This episode will be out on the 10th. I thought 11th. Super Bowl this was this Sunday on the sixth. No, this this Sunday is the Pro Bowl. Okay, you see, like I I don't watch. Is it? Football, is it? Oh so. man, I'm all messed up now. Oh. <laughs> 
So yeah, whatever. It will be Super Bowl. So whatever. I think the Rams are going to have a hard time because they have a lot of pressure on them. I'm going to say it now because they have to play in the Super Bowl in their own arena, in their own city. You, you have to state. cram in. You have to cram in the football talk. Like yeah. analysis, football. <laughs> You're so, you'd be surprised like how much discourse I hear between parents for in the kids class. <laughs> really? I, 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 and we're not yeah. big football guys, you know. I'm gonna say it right now. I'm from the Bay, so guess what team I like? Raiders. All right. <laughs> okay. I'm a Raiders fan, but I'm not like a huge, like, Oh my God, live and die by the Raiders. I like when they do well. I'm okay. When they do badly, it's like, Hey, you're a fan. Cause you enjoy the game, but just for that. Okay. So football. All right. So because we're going to have the Olympics here in LA in 2024, is it? 20- no, 2020. No, no, no. 2024 no, is Paris. No, we were going to get 2024. I always get that confused. They, yeah. They, they gave it to Paris. For, yeah. They gave it to Paris know. and we said, Oh, well you guys have after Paris. So it's 2028. We're going to have the Olympics here in Los Angeles. So what LA County has been doing because they're going to be the Olympics in America, in LA, they're trying to promote martial arts. Well, what I've noticed they're trying to promote martial arts in the LA area. So they can have maybe some hometown, like mem- some hometown people, uh, do Taekwondo, Karate, and Judo. The reason I know about this is because a few months ago, I want to say it was back in November, maybe October, I got an email from LA County and I got, uh, I got a flyer also. And I actually showed it to you when I got it. Mm-hmm. From LA County saying that we we're looking for instructors for these sports programs. And it was like normal stuff like baseball, soccer, like all the Olympic sports, gymnastics, all stuff. And at the bottom, they had Taekwondo, karate and judo which i thought was like oh that's pretty cool and it's because we want to support our local athletes so we can have some stars for the 2020 olympics 2028 oh, olympics they're 10 years too late <laughs> Just, <laughs> <They're 10 years. laughs> like, you, you plan this stuff like way ahead of time you don't do yeah. it like what in like eight years like yeah. i don't know like I don't know you might get it like just monster out there just like they guys have it I, wonder, I, I don't remember if they had wrestling on there i don't think they had wrestling uh, it sucks. Well, I have so, wrestling coaches. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I could have taught it maybe. No, I actually couldn't. I couldn't do judo either. So um, it was interesting because I was wondering, like, how did they get this list of who to send it out to? And I was thinking about it and I was thinking, oh, they probably just went on the NACA website and are looking for all the black belts that are on the website or any second dawn, third dawns that they're looking for and just sent out applications. So in my area, Koreatown here, there's there's a community centers and there's one community center I drive by every now and then. And they have this big sign outside, this big banner for judo. It was, it's judo Tuesdays and Thursdays, $10 classes on the bottom little part there. It says free uniform. And I was like, Ooh, free uniform. So they're going to have classes uh, Tuesday and Thursdays community center. I've always wondered who it was. So I actually stopped that. I actually stopped there um, last no, then I stopped there this week. I got their flyers, took some pictures and stuff. Cause I was actually in the area during the time during class when they were supposed to be having class. They weren't having class this week. They were um, just closed for the week. They're going to be next week. They said, and I bring my question of community center martial arts, how effective is it? And how, what do you think of it? Now, let me just go through what this community center is giving you. Okay. Now this program here, is being run. This is American Community Center. So many people that know what American Community Center is like. It's a Y a youth center, youth activity center, YAC, whatever they call them. Usually, like um, buildings inside parks or connected to schools. Usually, and kids can go do sports there. Usually, basketball, baseball. Sometimes they'll do catch uh, flag football and stuff. But easy sports. But they'll also do martial arts. They'll have like a karate class, a taekwondo class, and now more judo classes. At least for Los Angeles because of the Olympics. So in this program right here, it's a higher right here. Okay, so their classes are twice a week. Their age group is for children for the most part. They did once you're a teenager, you can't go because this age is five through 12 years old. Okay. It's ten dollars per class. So if you go to a class, if you go to oh, like you enjoy doing judo and you're going to every class, you're there every Tuesday, uh, Thursday with your family. That's how much is that? That's uh two, four, six, that's eighty dollars. Okay. I don't know if they have to join the federation, but they're, that's eighty dollars right there. City probably subsidizes it, is my guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, just to go to classes, that's eighty dollars, which is expen- more expensive than us. Just saying that, but you do get a free judo gi. And you're actually telling me that one of our members, uh, his daughter, does like a little 
extra workout another at a local mm-hmm. community center near his house and she got a free usa judo gi yep so if you want your kid to get a free gi i'll just go to his class sign up for it pay the ten dollars <laughs> to get the free gi and be like hey yeah my kid got another gi for judo because that's okay back to my thing like that's eighty dollars all right that's not a whole lot of money because i know for me growing up the one reason why I couldn't do karate, like I really wanted to as a kid, I love karate. I always wanted to do karate, was that every studio costs like a hundred, like probably close to hundred dollars. I don't know, back in the eighties, close to hundred dollars. Nowadays, definitely over hundred dollars, if not two hundred dollars. So, community center martial arts is very affordable. But what are you going to get out of it? How much are you going to learn? That's just a lot of questions I have about. What do you think? about community center martial arts. Cause here it's like two, two times a week, $10 a class, free uniform, but what can you do on their mats? That's another question for me. What are their mats? Are they on wrestling? Do they, do they have like a wrestling mat they roll out? Do they have like little those puzzle mats? Are they even training on mats? Hopefully they are if they're throwing each other. Is it just a uh, tumbling mats? What are they doing? So what can you teach them also if you're just using these softer mats? You, can you so, teach a kid Ipon Nagi on yeah. puzzle mats? That's a very loaded question. And I think Mm -hmm. it depends on what you mean, like what can you do with it? Cause I mean, if your goal is to train like develop, especially 2028, right. Um, develop a Olympic caliber medalists, like increasing the chances of that happening, then I don't know, man, like, what, what are the classes like? Like, you know, like cause I, most kids. I was classes, hoping to watch. I was hoping to go and watch yeah. and talk to the instructor there that day, but they were closed that day, so I couldn't. Because most so of the kid, most of the kids' classes are just playing games, getting them uh, not to be fat, like work out, <laughs> run mm-hmm. around, hand-eye coordination, listening to instructions, developing focus and attention span. Just keeping them healthy. That's what most judo classes are like and keeping them interested in judo enough for them to stay in it at throughout their teenage years. And yeah, but that's, you can't even do teenage years here because it's from five to 12. So say I yeah. joined the class at 11 or 12 and I'm like, wow, I really enjoy yeah. this judo stuff. I like it a lot. Once I'm 12, do I get kicked out? Is the instructor going to let me stay? That's why I'm saying it depends on what the, the classes are like. Cause you think if you go look at, let's just check out Instagram, for example, go look at like kids classes in Ukraine, in um, Japan, in Azerbaijan, in Kazakhstan, like look at what their kids are doing compared to what the kids here in America do. And you're just like, what the hell are they teaching them over there? <laughs> like, <laughs> why are they so serious? Why, but they have to have like the I, best I, students be like their the Instagram videos, right? Have like the most still, advanced like, students. Our, I think our most advanced kids would struggle to do even like a forward roll, you know? So like, <laughs> I'm, I'm exaggerating. They can actually, I'm, don't take me seriously. They can actually do a forward roll. But some of the stuff that these kids on the Instagram that you're seeing that they're doing, and it's not just one kid. You see like a group of them in class all doing the same thing. So it's kind of to counter your, the joke you were saying, but um, I can't even get adults to do some of that stuff <laughs> that well. Yeah. So it's just like, I think the community center dojo. Yes. If you want to grow judo, sure. If you're trying to develop, like, like shake up the foundation of how we develop athletes. I, I mean, I'm no, exp- I'm no expert. I'm not, like I've never competed high level. So, but I personally, just from outside looking, my opinion is that do you need, there's already a template out there of all these countries of what they're doing <laughs> uh-huh. that you're doing something that totally is not working clearly. So <laughs> our system is not working. Yes. Clearly it is not working how it should be or what we think it should be working. And that's just and one aspect. Cause like, there's always like funding. Like everyone's talking about funding is, is a funding training partners, the way you teach. I think parents also are, are a huge part of it. Like it's not mm-hmm. just the coaches and the, and the schools and yeah. So it's a very loaded question. Like I said, yeah. so well, it's like, I just want to put some things out there because I know in America, and I'm not talking like community centers, like for us, we're at a Japanese community center. Okay. Japanese community Institute. But we're not a community center. It's like a city run or city owned community center. And what I mean, community centers, like we talk about wise youth activity centers, places that are connected to high schools or parks and stuff like that, because a lot of Japanese community centers have judo programs. And that's where we're at. Like 
Sautel, that's out of a community center. Um, was it Valley? That's out of a community center. Um, San Gabriel, they're out of a community center. It's like a lot of places, they're out of community centers, but it's not taught a community center style, I'd say. Mm-hmm. In America, we just have this bad rap of community center martial arts. You can do baseball, basketball, like I said, flag football, tennis, mm-hmm. all these things at a community center, people won't bat an eye at. They're like, oh, cool, you're doing it there. You're at part of a summer league or part of like a, just a winter league, whatever it is, no problem. But if you tell somebody that I do, I do karate at the community center, like, oh, you do karate at a community center? They give you that look. And the reason why is because this is something that hap- was happening when I was younger, is that because martial arts is popular, People want to put their kids in karate or taekwondo, wrestling or judo to get them self-confidence and teach them martial arts and stuff so they don't defend themselves. They would do a very basic white belt, yellow belt, orange belt kind of style of teaching. And the instructors usually weren't black belts themselves, I found out. And this is after I started working in community centers. I worked at a community center teaching martial arts at a community center program called MAK, Martial Art for Kids. And I taught in Simi Valley and Thousand Oaks. And I got into that because I wanted to do martial arts when I was a kid, like going back to the thing, I wanted to do karate so badly. But my mom found a program that was called Young Olympians. And if you live in LA, like it was a big California thing. There's Young Olympians in Northern California, Olympians, Southern California, and Central. But what they did is that they created a very basic uh, Taekwondo system that was very easily taught to children. They had a lot of, um, not a lot of kata, but a lot of um, belt ranks. Like they have a lot of um, degrees. And so I found that when I was younger and those classes, guess how much those classes were when I was a kid? $10? No, I, I, for some reason, I keep thinking there are $7, uh-huh. but there are $5 apparently. Wow. There are $5 Infl- for inflation. Don't yeah. Inflation. There are $5 for once a week karate classes for one hour. And mm-hmm. then when I taught that community center MAK, that was $7 a week. And I just closed that program like maybe seven years ago or maybe more nowadays, time flies, but that was only $7. So because I got into MA, because I got into MAK after I did Young Olympian and stuff, I got my black belt in there. That program wasn't built to build black belts. My instructor, because he saw these kids like, like if a kid really likes martial arts and he wants to keep them in it, he's not gonna be like, okay, you're 13 now, kick you out. You have to get out now, go find a regular mm-hmm. dojo. He continued the program, built it to create a program to get kids into their black belts uh, and a real, not a black belt, like a, a double black belt, but you would call a junior black belt nowadays. People mm-hmm. call them, they would do. So he built this stuff. And what I found out during, during doing this is that they would hire people at regular community centers. They would hire people that weren't black belts. They would hire people that were like themselves only green belts or took a Tybo class or took some cardio kickboxing that could teach basic up, down, left, right blocks, teach a front kick and roundhouse kick, and that's it. So I don't think there's a problem with that. No, but there's not a problem with that till you get higher ranks. Yeah, but that's what BJJ does, right? So they have blue belts and purple belts teaching, like opening up schools in really rural areas where there's not much jujitsu, BJJ. Yeah. And then you would basically every three months have like a traveling black belt that comes and grades everyone. Yeah, that's the thing. You have a traveling black belt. A lot of these old yep. programs didn't have that. They'll just have someone there yep. that was a cardio or kickboxer mm-hmm. or something. Didn't know a whole lot of martial arts. I'm just trying to say teach. And because of that, it kind of got the bad rep of community center martial arts. Yep. Isn't that good. They don't teach you good technique. They don't teach you how to defend yourself. They don't teach yeah. you how to fight. My, my, my um, imagery of what you're saying is basically kind of like, I don't really trust community, um, not community center. Well, you community centers too, but like personal trainers. At mm-hmm. community, community training um at community centers and also at uh retail gyms mm-hmm. like most of them i i've trained with some um olympic lifters and when i was college mm-hmm. so after i graduated from college i jo- was working and i joined a gym and then most of the time when you join a gym they kind of give you like a free personal training session to try and lure you into paying for their services mm-hmm. So I always take them every time I change a gym and like all the personal trainers are, have absolutely no idea what they're talking about or what they're doing. Like they just pass the test. They just got their license, whatever it is. Well, they take, they have a lot of pseudoscience and bro science kind of stuff. Science. Yeah. Like, pro, like stuff like protein timing. Like if you look it up, there's no science behind protein timing. Mm-hmm. Um, now you talk about like eating pasta before you work out or something for the carbs. No, like you have to, you have to take a protein shake within X minutes after you 
do a workout or like the protein won't synthesize like properly. Like <laughs> this, that's an example, just one example. Or um, ah. another example is if you don't feel a pump or if you don't get sore, then you're not getting a, work, a good workout in. Mm-hmm. Like all that kind of stuff is like, there's research behind it. And it's just not true. And um, we're going on a tangent here, but basically that's kind of what I, I feel like you're talking about is basically, I wouldn't, I basically don't trust uh, personal trainers. Yeah. <laughs> so this is why in America, cause it's stuff like this, sometimes you'll get a really good instructor knows what they're doing, enjoys it. And then other times you get someone that doesn't know what they're doing. Like uh, going back to the way that I grew up uh, mm-hmm. doing young Olympians, even that program, even though it was built by a martial art guy was a black belt. He would hire people that weren't all black belts. It was a basic Taekwondo system based the way mm-hmm. he trained and the way he liked it, liked to train. But he would hire guys that were Kyokushin black belts, Shotokan black belts, Karate black belts, Tong Sudo black belts, Taekwondo black belts, Kempo black belts, uh, Kaji Kempo black belts. If you had a black belt and could show certification, he would hire you. But it was like, just take, just teach off the, cr- the criteria that I've given you, you know? Mm-hmm. But of course, because we're all black belts, we all think that we know the best. You're like, okay, I'll teach you a little bit of this, but I might teach you a little bit of my Kempo style. I'm going to teach you a little yeah. bit of my Karate style really hard. So that was a great program though. And that's how I met my instructor, a great guy, knows martial arts, taught me everything that I know. And that's, I was lucky. I was very lucky. But because so many of these other places teach like a cardio kickboxing Karate class, Taekwondo class, that's how community center martial arts in America gets a bad rap. Yeah. yeah. I know you, Anthony, you started doing judo at a community center in Hong Kong. Yeah. How was it out there? It was actually really, it, it followed closely what the Japanese do actually. Now that I knew more about how the Japanese train from mm-hmm. doing research, like as, as for kids basically, but it was at the YMCA in Hong Kong. Um, in, in the whole of Hong Kong at the time, there was only one YMCA and I think now there's two, but no, actually they shut down recently. So there's still one. There's back down to one. But mm-hmm. uh, seriously, YMCA, all of Hong Kong, the entire island yeah. only has one community center. Well, Hong Kong's the name of the island, but also encomp- the Hong Kong, the city encompasses uh, other parts that's connected. Yeah, because like, I know there's other islands yeah. and there's the, the yeah. what do they call yeah. them, the... The outer pref- not what uh, new territories, new yeah, the territories. new territories, yeah, yeah, the new territories. So there's Cal, there's Kowloon, there's Hong Kong Island, there's Lantau Island, and mm-hmm. then there's new territories, and then there's a bunch of smaller islands outside too. That all they all encompass part of Hong Kong. But um, I don't want to go too deep into history, but um, Hong Kong used to be just Hong Kong Island, like what's basically considered downtown now, Hong Kong Island, and then. Because um, they lost the Opium War, China, pe- we they, the British rented Hong- rented Hong Kong for ninety nine years, and then they also forcibly rented Cal well Kowloon and uh, New Territories. Mm-hmm. So that's how it became like that. Um, but yeah, the whole of Hong Kong only had one YMCA, and that YMCA was huge. Like I was just telling you earlier about how if you go to like a Sheraton or the W hotel, like that's what it felt like as a kid when I walked into this like super nice big lobby with like high ceilings and um, they had a hotel there. Um, I actually went to kindergarten there, Mm -hmm. uh, believe it or not. Um, They had a church there and that's why I went to kindergarten there is because most of my family is Christian. um, So my Christian part of my family would go to church there Mm -hmm. while I went to judo. (laughs) <laughs> like so and then after Two I went birds, to, one stone i like it yeah <laughs> and then we would meet up and we'd go have dim sum and then i'll get a mcdonald's happy meal <laughs> and then, it's so american <laughs> yeah so um yeah the ymca there's amazing they have other stuff too like there's just like the communities the ymca is here but I, I remember moving back here to america and then i went to my first ymca and i'm just like what the hell is this? Like <laughs> dumpy building falling yeah, a, apart. Yeah, it's falling <laughs> apart, dumpy, small. There's like no not many programs going on. Mm-hmm. And um it's small. Like that's the thing. The size itself is small. But um I would compare the YMCA to the Kodokan, actually. If you ever been to the Kodokan in Japan, that's basically mm-hmm. what the YMCA was like. This huge tall building wow. with multiple, multiple gymnasium levels and they had volleyball basketball courts but my sensei there at the time was um 
this old man and he didn't take anyone as a student. You actually mm-hmm. had to inter- you had to interview like I they brought me there and be like they're not going to ask you do you do you want to do judo because uh-huh. no kids want to do judo. See, look look at you. Know, I don't know. Like, I love like I don't know if I saw maybe judo when I was younger first, mm-hmm. but I love karate. I love karate. I, I my parents always say I came out the womb punching and kicking. I've always loved karate. You know, so I don't know if someone asked me when I was little. Yeah. But I was taking like those free karate lessons, those one, two day free karate lessons. I was like <laughs> four already. I was already taking like those free classes, get the free uniform, the free white belt, and be like, cha, cha, cha. I love karate at four already. Yeah. But for me, I actually really, my first martial art I wanted to learn was Taekwondo because mm. my school, after school program, had a Taekwondo class. And they would, uh, I would see my friends doing it while I was playing in the yard, waiting for my nanny to come pick me up after, after school. And, um, I told my mom, I'm like, Hey, I want to do Taekwondo. It looks cool. Like the, the punching and kicking and stuff. And all my friends were doing it. And she's like, no, I don't want you to get into fights with people and punching, kicking and everything. So you're going to learn judo because judo is good for self. Judo is good for self-defense. <laughs> I and want you to throw them and choke them out instead. <laughs> yeah. So she, did some research and she found that the YMCA that where I used to go to kindergarten mm-hmm. has, um, has a judo program. So took me there, signed me up. And then I really remember just doing the motions. I didn't understand judo at all at the time. And then my friend who took Taekwondo, we were like, let's spar, let's, let's spar and <laughs> see what, what happens. And uh-huh. I'm, in hindsight, I'm just like, man, I could have gotten seriously hurt, like, or hurt, <laughs> seriously hurt the other kid. But I threw him with Oso Togari and then mm-hmm. landed in a Kesa Katame with him. But yeah. obviously, do you know kids, Kesa Katame, they're not like, yeah, not super so tight. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't have control of the hand and he just started punching me in the face, like, <laughs> bam, 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 like, started punching me in the face. And then I, I was just thinking, why am I learning judo? This is like, the pin is like useless. Uh-huh. I am not, they don't teach me how to punch or kick. And obviously as a kid, you don't know anything about grappling. So mm-hmm. I went to my mom and I said, I want to, I, w- I don't want to learn judo anymore. Cause I always want to learn Taekwondo. And mm-hmm. she was like, okay, I'll let you quit judo. If you go to this tournament and try it out. Mm-hmm. So I went to this tournament and I was fighting a girl that was probably five or six inches taller than me. And also a blue belt. I was a yellow belt at the time. <laughs> she was a blue belt. Plus she, um, uh, as your was excuses, like, as your excuses. She, right was, now. she was like 12 and I was like seven basically. Uh-huh. So she threw me into, uh, with Koshi Guruma and then th- pinned me in the kiss of time right away. And obviously mm-hmm. because she's bigger than me, I'm not going to get out. And they didn't have enough kids at the time. So obviously that's why I got paired up with her. Yeah. And then I just remember looking at the clock, waiting for the Osai Komi counter to <laughs> count down. And then I'm like, if this was a street fight, I would do exactly what my friend did and just punch her in the face right now. Which, yeah. <laughs> please. Yeah. Please tell me you didn't start punching the girl in the face. <laughs> Get off me. Get off yeah. me. No, I didn't punch her. But then obviously I, I know it was, I knew it was against the rules. So I lost. Mm-hmm. And then I told my mom, like, I, I did it. I still want to quit because I hate it. I, I did hate judo at the time because mm-hmm. um, I wanted to learn Taekwondo. She still wouldn't let me learn Taekwondo, by the way. <laughs> so after that, it was my last time doing judo until I was 27. And I picked it back up at a community center mm-hmm. again at, yeah. in Austin, Kokoro but Judo. At an American community center or a community center, part of a Japanese community, part of a Japanese no, community it's center? No, it's an American community center. So if you guys live in Austin, that's where I started judo, um, Kokoro Judo, Glenn uh, and Darius runs a program there. They also teach out of a high school gymnasium in Round Rock in Texas. Like their program expanded to other schools. Um, that's where I found it. It's, you know, it's just a regular rec center. There's kids there playing. They actually host karate tournaments there too. And also play basketball and stuff there. So at the same we, time, it's awesome. <laughs> well, there's a lot of times we get kicked out and had to cancel class because they rented it out. It's, I'm not going to get too much into it. It kind of pisses me off, but mm-hmm. um, yeah. Community center dojos are, are not always bad. Like, yeah. Well, that, was any, yeah. that was a, I know, like I sound like I'm bagging on community center dojos and stuff, and I'm trying to be like, no, no, it depends on the instructor, you know, depends on where you're at and not instruct, not all instructors are the same, you know, you let, 
uh, I'm a third Don. Okay. So I have experience. I've been doing judo a long time. I've been teaching for a long time. So I know how to teach different people, different ways. I know how to teach someone that wants to be a heavy competitor. I know how to teach someone that wants to be a light, just part-timer. Mm-hmm. I know how to teach someone that wants to learn judo. And I know how to teach people that want to learn judo for their BJJ or the MMA. You know, mm-hmm. you're a first Don. You may not have the same experience, but you really enjoy teaching. But I know some other first Don and second Dons and some higher Don ranks that I know can't teach somebody. They can teach them their favorite move. Mm-hmm. But if I teach them like, Hey, can you teach this guy like a uh, Taitoshi? And they're like, Oh, I really don't know Taitoshi that well. It's like when you're a black belt, they expect you to teach, but it comes down to who you are and how you teach. And at these community center programs, like I said, sometimes you get someone that knows what they're doing. And sometimes they don't, it's a crapshoot. Like, Oh, what is this going to be? Is this going to be a good guy or a bad guy? I don't know. <laughs> and this is where it gets into me where, I think community center judo is very good. Like any martial art, community center, taekwondo, community center, karate, it's very good. If you want to see if your kid maybe likes martial arts or enjoys yep. judo, if they're, if they're going to be a grappler, a striker, what do they want to be? Instead of just going straight to an expensive taekwondo judo or a taek, or a karate dojo that's expensive and stuff, or put them in the BJ. Like I tell my cousins all the time, I told some of my friends before, they're like, hey, Juan, I really want to get my kid into grappling. How much do you think I should put him in the BJJ? And I t- always tell them, I'm not trying to take people away from BJJ. I'm not trying to, but I tell them, put them in a community center, put them in a judo class. Look for a Japanese community center near you because I know there are a bunch in Santa Clara. Take them to a judo school because it's going to be cheaper no matter what. No matter if you go to like a fancy school or not, it's going to be cheaper. Take them there. See if they enjoy grappling first. If they enjoy this stuff, then go take them to the fancy BJJ club and pay all that money. Go spend 200, 300 for their classes. But if you can find a community center like this one right here, where it's $10 a class, two times a week, even if your kid only goes once a week, that's uh, $40, okay? Which is still more expensive than us. Mm -hmm. And I keep saying that as people know out there, Hollywood Judo, our youth program, anyone under 12 training in our youth program, it is $40 a month. What, how much is it? 30, if you, 30 if it's auto pay, 40 if it's, uh, if it's um, month, month by month. month. Yeah, and you get $5 discount too if you bring two kids. So it's 25 for each kid if you do auto pay. Yeah. If you have two kids, yeah. And for us, we also, like for us, we have twice a week classes for youths mm-hmm. and we do occasional Saturday class Saturday classes also. So there's a lot of time that you can come and practice. Now we don't give free geese out. That's amazing. That's an amazing deal. This place is giving, <laughs> giving out free geese. That's like blowing my mind that USA judo is just giving them geese. That's great. So we don't give out free geese, but we do also require that you become a member of USJ, USJF, one of the federations for our insurance policies to cover us. And it also covers you, but no, most parents have insurance for their kids anyways. But back to trying out stuff. I do think that community center martial arts is good to try out martial arts. Because like you said, when you did as a kid, you didn't like judo, but you saw your friends doing Taekwondo and you tried judo out. It didn't mm-hmm. work out for you. And would you really want to do Taekwondo instead? Who knows? You could have been with your long limbs. You could have been an Olympian yeah. Taekwondo player. Yeah, you maybe. <laughs> your long limbs kicking me from across the room. Ah, get away from me, Anthony. <laughs> God damn it. I'm going to grab your leg and throw you. So that's where I come in. Like I tell people that they want to dip a toe in it instead of going to do a big contract at a BGJ place or a big Taekwondo place. Try out maybe a community center, see if your kid likes it. And if they do like it, then you can progress into something else. See, especially, I think, I think no, community no. center, oh, go ahead, yeah. finish. No, I would say, especially when some of these community centers right here, like I talked about my growing mm-hmm. up, it's from five to 12. What happens to that kid once they turn 12? You know, you're going to have to either put them in a, into a traditional <clears throat> storefront mm-hmm. or some kind of martial art place, unless the community center like understands that, Hey, I got some kids that are growing up. and want to continue doing this. Let's make a teens class. You know? Yep. So I, I get what you're saying. And I kind of think that's kind of unique to judo that community center is judo is like higher quality than mm-hmm. compared to other martial arts mm-hmm. because of the way that we do, we have a centralized body well, kind of centralized <laughs> national governing body that, um, verifies all these ranks so everyone who has a black belt or even a brown belt they have to be up to a certain degree of standard Mm -hmm. versus karate and taekwondo they're so fat even jujitsu i'll I'll go out there and say even bjj you'll you will find really bad bjj places i think it's kind of rare in la like in big metro metropolitan areas because there's so much competition you're going to be easily exposed oh yeah but i think 
you hear about fake BJJ places all the time in mm-hmm. more rural areas. And some of the instructions just not that good. Like, um, I think it's more it happens more to these other martial arts that have a very fragmented, um, governing body system and oh, they yeah. don't really verify their ranks as much. And also like Taekwondo, for example, it's really easy to get a, a black belt for kids. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. Buy um, a black was, belt, do your two year program, put you on this fast track, get your black belt. Yeah. I was actually talking to the friend I had dinner with after I saw that car accident, like I was mentioning earlier. And um, she was telling me how she found her old Taekwondo instructors dojo reopened in Inglewood somewhere. And she went into peak and there was like this young black belt girl teaching Taekwondo and the form is like terrible. Mm-hmm. And yeah. So I don't think judo has that, that problem, but the problem that I think judo does have is that, when you get a black belt, you're automatically qualified to teach. <laughs> like short on automatically qualified to teach, kind of. You just need to go take the, the coaching course and all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Or yeah. Even, I'll give you that. Yes. Yes. Even if you're not qualified to teach, people kind of like go like even for me, like when I go to BJJ, people, like, oh, you're a black belt in, in judo. Like, can you teach me this? I'm like, do you know that you could be really good at judo but still suck as a teacher? You know, like <laughs> of course that's yeah, <laughs> that's a big thing. You do it with and, any martial art. You'd be a great yeah. kickboxer, but when it's like, hey, can you teach me how to do your jab? I just mm-hmm. I can't teach you how to do my jab, my jab, my jab, my way. You know? Yeah. So that I think that's what um, the coaching clinics that Philippe is doing is trying mm-hmm. to fix is that yeah, you got your guy a black belt, but that doesn't mean you know how to teach. And I do think there should at least be some sort of test that te- teaches your um, test, your teaching skill. And it should have nothing to do with judo. <laughs> like <if laughs> how do you, you handle know, situations? How do you, how do you handle situations? How do you talk to children? Exactly. Um, how would you explain something complicated? Like how, for example, we, there was a kid that showed up to this is before COVID this 10 year old kid that was probably 170 pounds. Like, I think, mm-hmm. you know what I'm talking about this huge kid. Okay. And he just could not, do a forward roll at all. Mm-hmm. And then everyone tried and just gave up and they eventually just kind of forced him to do a forward <laughs> roll by grabbing him by the belt. Yeah. And he would have pa- literally have panic attacks when that happens. And he'd be like, Oh, my chest hurts. Like I can't breathe. And, and I, sp- I literally told at the time we had more assistant instructors and I was like, can you like run the, cause we, we separated into like the, the toddlers kind of like younger kids and then mm-hmm. the older kids and uh, Eric taught the older kids. And then I handled the smaller kids. Mm-hmm. And then I would tell Gak, you know, Gak, right? Yeah. He's one of the Brown belts that helps out back then. So I'd be like, Gak, I want you to go over this stuff with the kids today. I'm going to do a one-on-one with this kid. Mm-hmm. And I spent an entire month just doing, helping him how to do forward rolls. And I was trying out all different methods and I started researching how gymnat gymnastics people teach kids how to do forward rolls. And then I'm mm-hmm. like, Oh yeah, I never thought of that. I can use these tools and it has nothing to do with judo. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, so it took me an entire month and he was able to finally do a forward roll. And then mm-hmm. second month he was doing forward and backward rolls by himself. Mm-hmm. So it's like, this kind of stuff is like what people should be thinking about when they're teaching and not just like, how do I get him to do a soto gadi? How do I get mm-hmm. him to do this? Like, Oh, if he can't do it, I'm just going to move his hands for him or <laughs> like, yeah. So that's why I think, uh, judo is bad at compared to other, uh, schools. Cause, um, you can suck at karate, but if you can't teach kids, then no one's going to sign up. You know? Yeah. Well, I- that's the one interesting about judo. It's one of those few martial arts where any other martial arts, if you have a dojo of yourself, the kids are your guts. Kids and teens are your guts. They're your lifeblood. That's why you keep the doors open. Where I find that judo and even BJJ, it's not it's a lot of grappling styles for wrestling. A lot of grappling styles. Like, we don't need kids. We can live off adults. You know, it's a, it's a weird thing about that. Like for these heavy grappling systems, like, yeah, we don't yeah. need, like kids are great. I love to have some kids in the class or have a kid's program, but if I didn't have a kid's program, I, I'm fine with that. I, I sound terrible when I say that. I know that <laughs> I know it sounds horrible, but like even our dojo, we didn't have a children's program for almost 15 years. Yeah. You know, and the only reason we started a, t- uh, a children's program is because two of our instructors, their kids are starting to get to the age of like, they start to learn judo and they didn't want to have to sign up for another community center or another dojo or anything else. It's like we have our dojo here. We're black belts. Let's just start a kid's class. 
let's start a youth class. Why not? And that's how it worked out for us. It takes like for your regular for-profit dojo, like you said, kids are the, the main source of revenue. Yeah. And even, even community centers, right. It's mostly targeted towards kids because kids are mostly the people to have the time to go um, train. Um, and they're getting compensated for it. So they, they don't care if they stay in, stay in the program or not, but for mm-hmm. us where we're kind of nonprofit, it takes a certain type of people to basically teach these kids wholeheartedly while knowing 90% of them are going to stop judo in a couple of years. It's tough so. with some adults, some, some adults. It's like you said this before, like you tell a guy, it's like, yeah, I know in two weeks you'll quit. Or after no, two I, no, months, I said, I like said, I said, in, I said within, within six months, like half of you aren't going to be here. was what I said. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. you go to medical, it's like those, all those, all those medical dramas always. Yeah. It's like, okay, you're a medical school college or whatever. Look to your left. Now look to your right. Two of you will not be here by the end of the year. It's like, oh man, <laughs> that's how it is. Well, I, I said that without giving full context is that I did say most of you aren't going to be here in six months because you're just going to figure out it's not for you. Mm-hmm. And I did say that, but while you're here, if you're going to take away something from judo, I want you to learn how to fall properly because that will always stick with you. So, so mm-hmm. I said, so that's the full context of why I said, I wasn't trying to be like, <laughs> I wasn't trying to be like, yeah, we're hardcore. Like most of you, yeah. most of you going <laughs> to drop out of this special forces program. <laughs> and you're supposed to be the nice one. I'm supposed to be the mean one. <laughs> but I was, I really want to emphasize how important and useful Kemi was. That's why I said that mm-hmm. it wasn't, it wasn't like, just like, yeah, most of you are going to drop out. Like <laughs> <laughs> most of you won't survive this training yeah. here. <laughs> My Ukemi training some of the best in the world. <laughs> what was it? Nine out of 10 men don't survive. <laughs> so another thing with the judo program that's different than when we teach at our dojo is that we, we belt test when we feel the kids are ready. You know, mm. even with adults, we, we belt test when we feel they're ready. There's no set every three months, every two weeks or uh, two weeks. I would suck every two weeks you're getting belt tested, but like every three months, every four months, whatever it is, or six months, you're getting belt tested. It's more, okay, we see you learn the thing. You've learned all the moves. You've, you're doing well, let's test you. Okay. And I'm in the thing where I'm not, I don't like testing people if I know they're going to fail. Mm-hmm. That's why I kind of do like pre-tests or soft tests first, where again, when I was in young Olympians and when I worked for MAK, their thing was that we have set, um, set, was it semesters? Is it whatever? Like eight, like it was an, it was a, not eight week. It was a 12 week course. Mm-hmm. Okay. So there's four quarters a year, a uh, 12 week course. Every, every quarter you get tested for a new degree. So when you first start the white belt, after the first 12 weeks, you get tested for a yellow belt. If you get yellow belt, that's great. So then you need the next eight weeks, you're going to train again. You're going to test it for your first degree yellow belt, you know, which is, it's just little stuff. And it's also that it, it kind of pulls things out, but it gives the structure of like, okay, this is what you teach the kids till they learn, blah, 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 blah. Now this program here, the one in Los Angeles, the one that it, the doge, the community center that I went to, it was, um, was it eight weeks? I think it was, cause I, I remember seeing it. I thought it was a little short in my opinion. Uh, right here. Oh, it's not right, right here. I believe. Damn. I guess it's not written up here. They, sh- they should have just pulled the AJDN model. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they technically should have since they're a USA uh, Judo. Yeah, thing. Like, what, isn't that what it's for? <laughs> like, yeah. Oh man, how many classes is this thing? I want to. It might have been the. It might have been the banner that said it then. But I think yeah. the banner said that it was an eight. It was a eight week course. That's a two months. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking like, oh, so it's an eight week course. That means that you have to re sign up every eight weeks, or do you test the kids like for a yellow belt? And are you giving like little hash marks like, oh, here's your yellow belt with a white stripe? That's on it. what they. So the the dojo near my house. They that's what uh-huh. they do. That that's what they do. They have like a. Uh, um, I don't want to call it semesters, but basically that's. The, they didn't call semesters, but it's basically like they have session, oh, sessions. They call it sessions. sessions. So okay. there's a winter session, spring session, summer session. Mm-hmm. And then between each session, there'll be like a break, a week or two break where you don't have mm-hmm. classes. Yeah. And um, after each session, you would get a t- get tested, basically. Mm-hmm. This ha- same thing for adults. Like adults, mm-hmm. you would get a test um, and they also have a syllabus. They're basically saying like this session, these are goals to learn all mm-hmm. these moves within the session. Mm-hmm. And then they would test you and then you get a stripe belt rank and all that stuff. So uh, I guess it works for them. Like um, 
it can work That's, you know yeah. for me i think it works very good for karate and taekwondo for judo i'm not that sure because mm-hmm. i feel that we have, we teach so much more it's like you teach like you're gonna learn ipon sonagi and taitoshi and oh gosh or something or you're gonna learn that that session but I think it takes longer to learn it than just eight weeks. But yeah. I guess if maybe you're just teaching the kids like three throws each semester or each uh, quarter, whatever they're going to call yeah. it. Maybe that's better. Like teaching them also to Gadi into Kaskatami. That's all they're working. Might be a little boring, but that's all they're working for. Yeah, especially for kids. This is for adults too, but especially for kids. I think when you test them, you just want them to get the basics down. You're not, you don't want them to do it like the best like they're, they're you like, know fancy cross step taitoshi yeah. type stuff you know no hoppy neutral for, for example like what, let's say i, I don't want to say harai goshi because that's like a higher level technique than for a green belt i would expect them to do it better but if you're testing a yell about how to do a sotogadi if he does also the and he stumbles a little bit but as long for me as long as he doesn't fall down onto his mm-hmm. knees i think that's good enough you know mm-hmm. like his Maybe he didn't pull enough or lift the, the right hand enough. I think I still think that's good enough for a yellow belt because he knows what he's supposed to do and he's trying it, that he's just not there yet. But then when orange belt comes then I expect him to do the same throw a little better. So yeah, that's yeah, what so, I think. So that's just my thoughts and our thoughts on community center martial arts. And some people might not get this like, Oh, well in Japan, we do it like this or in Europe, we do it this way in Australia or whatever. It's it's a it's a stigma in America that if you do community martial arts, you're not going to learn good martial arts. But to me, it's just like going to any other dojo, or it depends on the instructor. And I think maybe in judo, because we're based off the system of we're very um, humble. You know, we're used to not making mm-hmm. money. We're used to not getting paid. You might get better instruction in judo at a community center than you might than you will get taekwondo or karate. So I think it's yeah, a great way to step this, in, get your toes. This is before it. this is before we even go into topics like that. I don't want to delve too deep into like for profit dojos. There's an incentive, especially if they charge their belt tests. And mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't want to call out which judo dojo does this, <laughs> but um, especially if they charge your belt test, there's an incentive for financial incentive for an instructor to force you to pass that belt test and also force you to like or to get your test. Yeah. Or to get your test. Like, okay. I have two stories about that. And that's a little one, one going a little tangent here. So the first one is one of our own judo students. They did Taekwondo before they came to judo. Okay. Very flexible, very, they can do stuff a lot. They're mm-hmm. catching judo very well. And when we were telling them like, okay, so we're going to test you for a yellow belt. The first thing was like, Oh, well, how much does that cost? I'm like, <laughs> um, nothing. You know, so like, take you to the side here. Or maybe during class, just ask you for this stuff. So it's not going to cost me anything. No, because they got to think like, oh, how much is that? Like, because the Taekwondo, yeah. you got to pay for your test. You got to pay for your new belt. Sometimes you got to give a donation to the to the dojo. <laughs> or yeah, or what some do that I hate. I hate because I went to a Hapkido place that did this. It was a Hapkido slash Taekwondo place. Is that each belt rank you got, you had to buy the dojo's new uniform for that belt rank. Yeah. And I get that because I'm a Taekwondo, I'm a Taekwondo, I'm yeah. a Tong Sudo guy. And in Tong Sudo, you wear a plain white gi until you get your red belt. Then you have to get a red belt gi. And some people mm-hmm. get a special green belt gi also. You don't have to, but you can. And again, you go, oh, you wear the white gi. Then you can get your green belt gi. Then you get a red belt gi. And then you get your black belt gi. So I get that. I kind of get that in that thing. But some places will charge you each, like get a yellow belt gi. You got to get an orange belt gi. You got to get your green belt gi. You got your purple belt gi. You got your blue belt gi. You got to get a brown belt gi. <laughs> so when I told that person, like, oh, we're, no, no, we're not going to charge you. Like, oh, okay. Well, if I pass, how much does the belt cost? And I was like, what does it matter to you what the belt costs? I'm going to go buy it at this community center. I'm actually going to have to go buy it at Pro Box. Hey, Pro Box needs some advertising on us. I'm going to go buy a Pro Box. And they're like, so I have to buy it myself. I was like, no, you don't. Like, I, I understand. Like, it's like, I totally yeah. get where they're coming from because I came from that, not that it came directly from that system, but I know how the Taekwondo and yeah. some karate systems work. So I get it. But every time it, I had that reconversation with somebody, it's like, what? The test is free? Yeah, the test is free. Oh, uh, do I have to pay a donation or give you guys something? No, do you have to pay us anything? Do I have to pay for the belt? No, you're not going to pay for the belt. They got to pay for a certificate. What do you understand? Free is free. <laughs> free, free, free. It's free, free. For free, free, free. <laughs> well, for me, it's like, yeah, if you want to charge it, you might as well just put it into your membership costs. Yeah. You know, I like, well, why, why don't you? I, I just hate nickel and diamond like that. The yeah. worst I've seen is at a BJJ club. I've seen people pay for stripes. Like pay for a stripe. Pay for <laughs> those little tapes around their belt. Like, How much that's does the worst I've seen. $60? I'll give you a deal, 30. It wasn't, it wasn't that much. It was like 25 or something like okay, that. Okay. Right, yeah, right. it was 25 for a stripe. And then when you get your next belt, it was like 70 or something. Uh, but 
yeah the why why were we talking about this we're talking about <laughs> like, this because of how some places are when it comes for for profit oh and they yeah charge there's, a, there's an incentive yeah well this is now the other part of my story about like how we're super free and stuff even when i worked at when i worked at marshall for kids we didn't i think maybe charge the kids like half the price for a belt i think that was it if they passed mm-hmm. So even, and we, we charged them at what we got them at. We mm-hmm. didn't charge them for like what a full price belt would cost. And we charge them at what we charge, what we would get them from the whole supply, from the supply store for. Um, but then going to how my, um, this is about my dark side of my karate past, but my uh, grand, I guess you'd call my grandmaster because he's my instructor's instructor. He was a really good black belt martial arts, knew how to spar, had great form, all stuff, but he had problems. You know, he had a dark side, had some problem stuff. And him, since he owned his own dojo, guess what he would do? Bills are due. I'm running out of money. I blew everything on something else. Belt test, everybody. Belt test. Yeah. Everybody's getting belt test. <laughs> and there's like people that weren't ready for belt test. Like, hey, you know, you've been here a couple of weeks. Let's get you a yellow belt or something, <laughs> you know? Or he would do like, like or another funny time. Another funny story was that he would kind of do belt tests like every three, like his clockwork belt test was like every three, four months, he would belt test people. But you knew if he needed money, if it was like every month or every three weeks, he was like, so we're going to do a belt test today, guys. Oh, who wants to get the belt test today? Hey, you know, let's get you your green belt. Let's belt test you today. <laughs> so you might get those instructors too, where it's like, uh, where did all your money go? Uh, I blew it on the Super Bowl, all right? <laughs> so that's my problem with paying for a belt test is the financial incentives. There's conflict there. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, I, without that, it's like, I, when I teach, I think when we teach people, it's like, we teach what we think is best for you. And we say things the way it is. We we're not trying to keep you around for your money, obviously. So it's like (laughs) I need your money. I need your, I need your money. It's just, I'm not living or dying off. You stay going. All right. Yeah. So I want judo for you. I want you to be good at judo. All right. (laughs) That also allows me to be very direct with the parents where I'm like, basically hinting like, parent your children no parent your children i'm not going to parent them for you basically yeah. if they can't behave like i'm going to ask them to leave like get off the mats like some of them just expect to drop their kid off and then come back in two hour an hour and like so that <laughs> just for business city yeah so that's that's the pro of like community center non-profit dojos like that is like ours i think is that there is no financial conflicts of interest so mm-hmm. if that's the kind of training you want then you want your kids to get quality training where they won't be told like, Oh, you're doing so good when they're absolutely like trash yeah. or not. We're not, behaving. McDo- we're not McDojo's here that puts you on the, Oh yeah. Pay us 10,000. You got on the fast track plan to get your black belt. You know, we got like some six. That's, year old a, that's black the belt. extreme end. Like what? Yeah. That's the extreme end that you're talking about, but I'm talking yeah. about how like even for profit, there would be some sort of financial incentives for them to behave and teach differently. Basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was I mean, one I, time. I, I'm just gonna get a ton of hate mail from a few for profit dojos. I know. Ah, go ahead, bring us the heat. Come, come to our dojo, please, please. We have Saturday. Not, okay, to clarify, I'm, I'm not saying all <laughs> for profit dojos do that. I'm just saying no, but some are weird. Yeah. Like, so my pops, he run the painting and run the painting place in the in us. What's that damn place called? Um, not Santa Cruz in um. Well, out there, okay, out that yeah. area. So I used to stay with them sometimes, and I help with big projects. Near his house, there was a Taekwondo dojo. Total, it wasn't a Mick, it was pretty much a Mick dojo. I don't want to say like Mick, Mick dojo, but it was pretty mm-hmm. Mick dojo. So I would go there. I did, I did their free program. I paid, no, I did, I did, I paid like 20 bucks or 50 bucks or something to do their two week program. Mm-hmm. I got the free gi, the free gi, you know, became a member of their thing. I trained with them. This is what they would do. So they would teach, they would teach technique. It was okay technique, nothing super special, nothing super great. But the last, like, 10 to 15 minutes of class, almost every class, he would put up this net. And I was like, what are we doing? We're we going to fight. We're we going to get in it. It's going to be fun. They would play indoor soccer the last like 15 minutes of the class. That's so what they the, do. That's what they do that in a lot of countries for judo, actually. See, this is a weird thing to me. It's like, but it wasn't a judo. This is taekwondo. Okay. So it's not like it's you're still, still using your feet. It's using your feet, but it's, how about instead of using my feet, how about I work on kicking drills? Okay. What if I kick pads? Okay. It's what like if I just game. do air kicks? It's like a game. It is a game, but to me, it's just wasting time. Yeah. And his excuse was, I think, was like, it builds cardio. Now you would also build some cardio, throwing kicks for one minute straight, you know, doing roundhouse kicks one minute straight, doing blocks and punches. You know, it was just weird to me that I'm paying for this and I'm playing kickball 
inside a inside of a this little what do you call it um storefront karate uh, taekwondo dojo it was like the weirdest thing to me i was like this is just bs and so then i got you, kicked out if you, I, you can you can ask any of the french judokas that are at our dojo like they'll tell you they play football well, soccer the sorry so, so, <laughs> no a few of them like uh camille and uh, yannick asked them like they yeah. they play they play football soccer i i still soccer. think it's I hey give me give me some hate for international fans. You know, like, I still think it's a stupid thing. You'd be doing kicks or punches or doing something else, hitting bats. And anyways, I got kicked out of dojo. Anyways, I didn't get to do my free two my two weeks. I tried. Mm-hmm. I paid for. The guy kicked me out like after a week and a half, saying that I was too aggressive and that I'm much more of a kickboxer. And this is a oh. this is a family dojo. You know, you hit a little too hard. And I was like, Get the hell out of here, baby. <laughs> but um, yeah. I mean, it's like what what you said. Um when parents here, let's say like, I want to sign my kids up for Muay Thai or BJJ. The community center is like the last place they're going to look up. <laughs> they're going to be <laughs> looking for a storefront kind of thing. Yeah. But in most other countries, it's like, I want to sign my kids up for this sport or this mm-hmm. program. They would go look at the community center. Um, even judo. That's where my, where my mom looked. Mm-hmm. Um, also in Japan, like in Japan and France, I'm sure that's where most people look to. Um, yeah. One thing I really hate when I talk to people about uh, when I tell them that judo is like super popular everywhere else in the world, mm-hmm. except for America and even in Brazil, like they don't believe me because they're like, I went to Brazil once. I didn't see any judo places. I'm like, that's because they don't advertise have storefronts and they know, don't have yeah. storefronts. They're in community centers. Yeah. <laughs> subsidized by the government. Like, yeah, just it would be like saying BJJ is more popular than judo in Japan because you don't see any judo dojos like out in the open anymore in Japan. They're all in police stations and community centers. Like I, when I went to train in Japan, they're all in community centers. So mm-hmm. they don't advertise. There's no storefronts. In fact, yeah. it's so hard to find a place to train. I actually had to ask Sensei Moss to find a place and then they don't have a website. Like they don't yeah. have a Facebook. Like how do you find it's them? Like, a word of mouth and stuff. And, and especially if you're in Tokyo, where's most people going to go? If you're in Tokyo, mm-hmm. you want to do judo, where are you going to go? What's the first thing off the top of your head? Kodakon. Kodakon. All yep. right. If yep. you're in Osaka, what's the first place you're going to think about doing judo when you're in Osaka? Kodakon. Osaka Kodakon. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you're going to go to those places. All yep. right. So it's, it's just like that, but it's a different thing. It's a different thing in different countries, you know, yep. that's why I, I feel bad giving community center judo a bad rep, but it's more about the instructor. Like I keep on saying the instructor, yeah, how I, they teach I, and what they teach. I think Americans are more, um, care more about branding in that sense and mm-hmm. marketing and like the, the customer service part of it which this uh-huh. this is the part where i agree with jimmy pedro and travis stevens and what what they're doing in the sense mm-hmm. is that we need to rebrand judo and market it better that way for community centers um yeah we're guilty of that too like so but we're doing better than most people i i think yeah well we're trying to we're trying to make you more popular so to round up the conversation like i said before we brought up before say it again if you want to put your kid in community center martial arts, that's a great idea. Get their toe wet, see if they like it. And then from there, if they like it, find a, I hate saying this, I want to say like, I find a real dojo, mm-hmm. but find someone that takes judo a little bit more serious. Okay. And if you're lucky and you have a good instructor, you know, look them up and see, you might have a really good instructor, someone that teaches really well. And they don't have to be a champion. They don't have to be a summer national, winter national, USA mm-hmm. champion, part of the Olympic team. They went to the Rio Olympics, whatever. They don't have to be that. A lot of instructors, some instructors, just are just good judo guys that just love judo like anthony here he loves judo he's a great guy you know it goes back to what i said about he can't be yeah we we know national champion like me you know we know some really good guys at our dojo that we probably wouldn't ask to teach people yeah (laughs) oh (laughs) oh, i I, there's a few (laughs) yeah definitely a few oh man he's dead he's gone (laughs) (laughs) all right hopefully uh who are thinking about this listen to this and then he's gonna throw me the saturday really hard (laughs) All right. So Anthony, is there anything else you want to talk about this or anything else you want to bring up? uh, I guess we'll talk about Paris Grand Slam when it's done. Yeah, we'll maybe talk a little bit about it. Okay. So that's it, Anthony. You sure? Yeah. All right. Do you want to do the outro or you want me to do the outro? You go ahead since you took the (laughs) intro too. No, no, you no, oh, okay. No, 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 no. Go ahead, Anthony. Okay. Do the outro. Do the outro. Next no, no, no. Next episode, I'll do the intro and and you do the outro. No, no, I want you to do the outro. 
Okay, I'm gonna do my own outro. Okay, <laughs> oh, do your own outro, all right? Because okay, this don't... lazy motherfucker right here. <laughs> and we're gonna we're gonna swap the catchphrase at the end. Okay, swap the catchphrase. All right. Okay. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Uh, smash that like button and was or was smash that subscribe button. Smash that say. like and subscribe. Yeah. I think some some of the stuff that people say now is hit the notification bell if you want to find out when we have new uploads. Uh, we're doing short videos. Um, so a lot of people don't know that because they only listen to our podcast. Um, so hit that notification bell and follow us on Instagram. You can find it in the description because <laughs> I'm just going to say that you find it in the description <laughs> down below. Uh, yeah. So see you guys next time. And don't forget to slap the mat. Yep. <laughs>